Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIA in Dublin. It's a real pleasure to welcome those of you who've been able to join us here at our headquarters, and hello to those joining online. I have a, a very short but very enjoyable role, which is obviously welcome you to building common ground, reconciling relations, Belfast, Dublin, London, that we're absolutely thrilled to be collaborating again with the John and Pat Hume Foundation, our good friends there. But all I get to do is to introduce today's chair, who's Tom Arnold. Tom is a great friend of the Institute, indeed serving as Director General from 2013 to 2017. So Tom, thanks for coming back and for being available, and I hand you the floor. Barry, thank you very much. Um, it's a particular pleasure to, to be asked to chair this session. Uh, I think it's uh, an important topic at a very interesting time. And welcome to all the people who are uh, following us online as well. And we hope that you're, you can uh, deal with or offer questions, etc. So the, um, the three speakers, that's the most important thing. Journalist Carney, uh, David, Gra David Graham, and uh, Imer, Imer Curry. And I'll introduce them in, in a bit more detail uh, as, we, as we go on. But um, the title is particularly apposite, I think. Uh, Building Common Ground, Reconciling Relations, Belfast, Dublin, and London. And I suppose it's, we're having this meeting relatively soon after a really important development in Northern Ireland, the restoration of the um, assembly and the executive. And so I think the topic today is of particular relevance. I I know journalists for the last couple of years, and I, I very much admire some of the work that he's done, and we'll get a re reflection uh, uh, on it uh, today. And then I think I'm particularly pleased as well that David has made the trip from, from, from Belfast, former DUP special advisor in Belfast City City Council, among many other things. And then Senator Emer Curry, Fine Gael, Sen Shannon spokesman for special education and inclusion and in Northern Ireland. So I think we go straight into it. And just a little bit more detail about Charles. He's a, 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 a strategy advisor and over the past decade, he has served as an independent uh, appointed equality commissioner for Northern Ireland, a parole commissioner for Northern Ireland, a senior manager, manager in the health service, an advisor on democratic reform projects sponsored by the European Commission and the US-UK Foreign Office in the Balkans, and a media uh, contributor and regular columnist with the Irish News. Between 27, 2007 and 2014, Jarlett was a ministerial policy advisor and special advisor in the Northern Ireland Executive, after which he has ended any associations with party politics. Prior to that, he spent 15 years in media, laterally as a political correspondent. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Jarlett Kearney. Thank you, Tom. No, that's it. That's it. With friends, I am very grateful for the opportunity to be here today and to be with such an esteemed panel. I'm reminded that when I look back on today's date, 29 years ago today, the UK and Ireland governments published the joint framework document. And that was perhaps the most thoughtful and broad philosophical exploration of Ireland-UK relations that we've seen probably throughout the last 50 years. And it helped to set the scene for the Good Friday Agreement. And in particular, paragraph seven of the joint framework document is worth exploring in the context of some of the things I wish to talk about and I'm sure colleagues will touch upon. In this framework document, both governments describe a shared understanding reached between them on the parameters of a possible outcome of the talks, consistent with the joint declaration and the statement of 26th March, 1991. Through this, they hope to give impetus and direction to the process and to show that a fair and honorable accommodation can be envisaged across all the relationships, which would enable people to work constructively for their mutual benefit without compromising the essential principles or the long-term aspirations 
of either tradition or of either community. And for the two governments to get to that point, I think was really something quite important at that juncture in Ireland-UK relations. Unfortunately, we are very far from that shared understanding today. And I was talking to somebody recently and I said, I wondered whether if we had christened strand three as strand one, we would have given much greater priority to it. Because strand three is the framework within which the rest of the agreement and the constant evolution of Ireland-UK relations actually has to take place and be managed within. So thinking about where we're at today and why that's important. Geopolitics and global impacts upon Ireland and the UK will affect both islands exactly the same in broad terms. They'll have different abilities to manage it, but we will be affected by the ecological and environmental challenges that are coming, particularly if the, uh, the Gulf Stream collapses. It won't see an Irish Sea border. In Europe, we're looking at very, very precarious rise of right-wing uh, politics and right-wing governments, potentially. Uh, in terms of economics, we're looking at the shift between Northern Europe and the US alliance, and then BRICS and the impact that that can have. In national security terms, the impact of uh, Russian interference, the impact of China's interests in Ireland and the UK will not see any border in the Irish Sea. We have a lot of shared challenges at geopolitical level that we need to confront collectively. In terms of the East-West, then the London-Dublin relationship, unfortunately, we're in a pickle. We're in a pickle partly because of Brexit, substantially in recent years, but that's not the only factor at play. Both governments took their eye off the ball of the agreement and the need to sustain stability in circumstances where the divided community in Northern Ireland played out in the politics of the executive, which at times was not in the interests of the greater good. And we saw a number of collapses over the lifetime of the executive, particularly in the last 10 years, the executive has been disabled more often than it's been able to assist. The governments are the key to steering that ship. That's absolutely critical. So how do the governments do that if they are not talking, if they're maybe taking lumps out of each other, if despite good public appearances, there are frictions and tensions undergoing uh, beneath the, the surface. The only way they can do that is by restoring the kind of relationship that they had around the time of the joint framework document. That has to be a key priority. Will that happen in advance of the next elections? It is unlikely, but there has to be much greater work put in to recognizing that there are good people in London within government and within the broader kind of civic space just as there are good people in Dublin within that same arena. And we need to find ways of each of them working much, much closer together. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about the kind of roadmap and thinking that I think can inform that. And then the other aspect is within Northern Ireland itself, where despite the good fortune that we have in recent weeks of the assembly being restored, we are in fact looking at a kind of meta conflict continuing just below the surface again. And until and unless the governments are in a position to jointly frame that situation, then constant identity issues are going to bubble up in the lifetime of the current executive. The underlying kind of issue or overarching issue perhaps is that there's an ongoing discussion about constitutional change. I see the issue of constitutional change merely in terms of societal evolution. The Constitution of Ireland has had numerous amendments added to it, some of which have been added, some of which have failed. The United States Constitution is exactly the same. Constitutions get amended. Our Constitution in Northern Ireland 
is the Good Friday Agreement and the Northern Ireland Act 1998. That sets out the approach, the parameters within which we are to evolve as a society. So when it comes to managing the evolution and the discussion around all of that, I think we need core principles to be applied across the board. And those principles are around patience. And I think we need patience because putting deadlines and timelines on constitutional evolution is not helpful. I think we need prudence, prudence in terms of what we say, how we say it, our actions, and we need partnership. And the partnership will, in the first instance, be led and driven by the governments. And in some senses, the Irish government are probably going to have to work a bit harder at rebuilding the partnership because London has had so much difficulty in maintaining cohesion, even though some people are trying to do their very best. What does that look like going forward then? How do we manage the constitutional evolution that is inevitable in every single society? I think we manage it within a political management framework that over coming years should be agreed and implemented and overseen by a partnership of the two governments. I envisage that in terms of a two states, one system approach. It's not a solution. It's not a, a concept that applies in every single circumstance. What it is, is an idea for managing the approach. We're going to have two states on this island for the foreseeable future. That's a reality. There are going to be two states between the two islands for the foreseeable future. That's a reality. What we know for certain, however, is that on the island of Ireland, greater one system working works for everybody. And I think of it in terms of health. I think of it in terms of tourism, in terms of the economy. It does not interfere or damage constitutional aspirations to ensure that we start thinking in much greater one system concepts. That comes back then to the original issue about the geopolitical challenges that we're all facing. We have to face them together. Now, that doesn't mean that we have identical policies on every single issue. Unity of purpose and unity of practice does not necessarily require unity of politics. We need a sense of working together on the issues that I talked about, the ecological, environmental, economic, political, the European issues, the national security issues, and also then the issues within public policy in Northern Ireland, particularly around the border areas and across the island itself. And all of this, you see, is summed up for me in a particular question, which is about exploration rather than binary choices. And the binary choices of identity say you're either Irish or British or both. But you have to choose. You have to choose whether you're pro-union or you're pro-unity. You have to choose whether you're Catholic or Protestant, whether you're nationalist or unionist. If we change the question, we might be able to explore the future that we're all going on together very differently. And the question that I want to leave you with is this. How do we collectively, across these two islands, successfully organize ourselves for sustainable coexistence? Because that's what we have to do. And I leave it just opening there, Tom. Thanks. Thank you very much, Darla. Next speaker is Jim Hughes. That's a very good summary of a most impressive document that Charles has written entitled Two States, One System, Patience, Prudence and Partnership. So if anyone wants to get a greater level of detail to what he's just said, you'll find it there. And I would commend it for reading. Um, we now move to David, David Graham. David is a former DUP special advisor and Belfast City Councillor. Uh, he's also worked as Director of Communications and Media Relations at Glasgow Rangers and as General Manager for Linfield's Football Club. These are two challenging positions. <laughs> so you're bringing all sorts of insights into into life in on these islands and he now runs his own property and hospitality businesses with his wife david we're delighted you were able to come here and join in this 
discussion this afternoon. Over to you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to come and speak. Um, I think I'll hazard a guess. I'm probably the only orange man sitting in the room uh, and probably the only season ticket holder at Ibrox, but uh, we're here to find common ground. So uh, I do like pints of Guinness. So if anyone wants to buy me one after, you're all, uh, I'll not refuse. But no, look, it's, it's a privilege to be here. And I was thinking on the car on the way down about what are the examples of uh, you know strong relations between uh, Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and then ultimately then the, the United Kingdom as well. And, uh, you know, I, th I think the fact that I got from door to door in just over an hour and a half highlights one of the strong infrastructure connections between Belfast and Dublin. And, you know, when I think back, you know, to when uh, my forefathers were snowballing Sean Lamas and uh, Terence O'Neill in about 1965, you know, really, I think the fears back then were much more uh, disproportionate. Um, and I think they were exploited uh, much more than than was required. And, you know, sadly, and it wasn't the only cause, but we, we know then what came after for the next 35 years. And, you know, I think now and thinking about uh, myself and, and, and my family and thinking about what, what sort of Northern Ireland do I want to live in? What sort of island do you want to live in? And, you know, I'm conscious that engagement, I think, is is an important part of uh political uh, society now where it wouldn't have been very long ago that, you know, someone like myself would have been heavily criticised for coming down and speaking at an event like this. Um, in fact, I probably will receive a level of criticism from, from, from some quarters, but, you know, we shouldn't fear that. I mean, I mean, I voted to leave the EU, so I'm, you know, I'm sitting here and I'll be totally honest with that. But, but one thing where, you know, a, a huge, huge, downfall and pitfall for for whether you want to call it unionism or 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 pro brexiteers was that there was a total failure to engage particularly from the british government after uh, uh june of 2016 and i'm paraphrasing here with this anecdote but there was a famous moment when uh, angela merkel hung up on on boris johnson um I, i'm sure there are very few in, or many in the room would like to do the same if they're on a call with with boris god bless him but um uh, hung up with, with Boris and essentially it was a case of, right, you know, de deals off, essentially. So uh, Tom McTague, a, a journalist from the mainland, said, look, let's explore why Angela Merkel had such a strong position uh, regarding there couldn't be a hard border on the island of Ireland. And essentially, and, and look, anecdotally, rather than giving it a, a, a detailed analysis, what essentially the EU had done and what the Irish government had done was they had firstly brought diplomats from right across the, the European Union, and they had essentially given them a tour of the border, north and south, spoken to people in Enniskillen, spoken to people in Cavan, and said, in real world terms, this is what would happen if there was a hard border. This is how it would affect my life. This is how it would affect my kids going to school. Then after doing that, the second part of the strategy was to then bring journalists from all across Europe and told them the same story. Now, I, I'm not here to necessarily discuss the rights and wrongs of what that was because it you know it was essentially in many ways a strong bit of propaganda and engagement and, and networking but what it did do was that Angela Merkel who was one of the most important players in, in the game at that time she was so fixed on the position that there couldn't be a hard border in, uh, on Ireland that she hung up on Boris. Now there's many rights and wrongs in there but I think the, the fundamental reality is that the British government sat in their hands. You can say because of the level of disruption and uh, how, how fragmented they were at that time. You can accuse them of being arrogant. You can accuse them of being naive. But I think in Northern Ireland in particular, we, we felt the uh, the full brunt of the, the, the deterioration of relations between London and Dublin. Um, and I don't think, you know, I, I don't think Dublin was, would, uh, you know, Dublin has to share some of the blame, I think, as does, does Belfast and as, as does London. But you know, I think that, you know, we all have to learn lessons from every period of time within society. And I think that we, you know, we all have felt uh, the impact of, upon Brexit. In fact, it probably in, in modern day terms has had the most impact on the constitutional direction of, of Northern Ireland in particular uh, than, than really any other event in, in the hundred odd years Northern Ireland has been here. So as Jarlath has mentioned, it's a case of where are we now? And I think that I suspect everyone in the room will agree with me that you know, Stormont being up and running is uh, on balance a, a good thing. Um, 
I don't think it's perfect. Um, it's not a panacea. I've seen from inside the machine, uh, as Jorleth will have, the, the things that you can achieve, the things that you can, um, as we'd say, get done. Um, but we also need to, when we drill it down and be you know, self-critical, stable government and, and functioning government are, are two different things in my, uh, in my view, because what we can't as, as citizens of this island accept is Stormont being up and running is simply good enough that essentially the, the, the shutters are up uh, and the blinds are open. What we actually need is a functional government. And I think that's where the real challenge is. And, and I think that it, it's really, a, it, it, it's not a criticism of, of the Belfast Agreement. It's not a criticism of St Andrews. But in reality, because we are essentially a minority government that is trying to make collective decisions, that in human terms is, is very difficult. Um, you know, I, I was when when I worked at Linfield, um, historically they have 17 men on the board. Um, and setting aside the, the demographic or the narrow demographic that they represent, trying to make any decision with, with 17 people in a room is, is is very, very challenging. And I think when we look at the executive table, uh, you can have up to five uh five parties around the room, uh, around the table, I should say, who all are then sent off to their silo with you know their bag of money and said, you improve the roads, you improve the schools, you improve the health service. We need to have a collective blueprint. And, you know, we haven't had a programme for government in Northern Ireland for as long as probably I can remember, or at least a, a working programme for government, because I know certainly when I was there and you were looking at education acutely at that topic, we have too many schools in Northern Ireland because we have too many sectors. And the legacy of that is because there's Catholic sector there's the state sector we then have grammar schools which i know opens another conversation uh we, we don't really have fee paying schools the way we, we do here in the south but we have too many schools in in too many towns but we've already seen the british government have, have sent across 3.3 million pounds i suspect and i don't have the information on this but i suspect there have been caveats privately that have been agreed to regarding revenue raising um whether that's prescription charges, tuition fees, water charges, and, and straight away in the first few days, both the First and Deputy First Minister have, have ruled certain things out. And I think one of the dangers that we have here, and I say we, I mean this island, is, is the increase in, in populist politics. Um, Jorleth has mentioned the, the wider right-wing politics, and I think it, it, it's, as, it's clearly, I suppose, a lot of right-wing politics has been built on populism and you, you, you can see it in, in uh, America with, with Trump uh, uh, as well. And I think that one of the challenges we have here is that if there is a change uh, in the South, like there has been in Northern Ireland and Sinn Féin come into to power, one of the challenges is, with, without taking this conversation party political, is that Sinn Féin are a, a populist party um, and they will make decisions based on, on the direction that the wind is blowing. And I think that for me to take it back to Northern Ireland, until we grasp the nettle of grown up politics to say, look, we have five, six health boards, that's too many. We're going to have to try to sell the idea as, as crass as this sounds. And I hope that none of, none of us in the room to face this situation, but you know, you're going to have to travel over an hour for cancer treatment. You're going to have to travel over an hour for specific medical care because we simply can't afford to have it in three, four corners of Northern Ireland. So I think probably to, to, to bring it back and go back to having and fostering good relations. In my view, we need Northern Ireland to work. Northern Ireland will work if as many people as possible wanted to work. That the Irish government put the shoulder to the wheel, the British government put the shoulder to the wheel. And, and as Jarla said, that we accept that for the foreseeable future that there are going to be two states in this island um, and certainly as a unionist, I, I don't fear cooperation. I know that the, this idea of an, an all-Ireland economy, for me, of course, I want the economy in Northern Ireland to have a much stronger link with the UK, not because it's red, white and blue, it's because in my view, it is it is a stronger economy and it will link us to, to, to broader parts of the world. But also, you know, we shouldn't fear, as I said at the very start, we shouldn't fear sharing railway lines, we shouldn't fear sharing roads, we shouldn't fear sharing water supplies, because as I said, to bring the, the, the uh, my conversation full circle, 
that's essentially what Terence O'Neill wanted to do uh, in 1965. And I think in many ways, and Peter Robinson used to say this to me privately, where for Northern Ireland to work as part of the United Kingdom, we as unionists need to make Northern Ireland as palatable as possible for as many people as possible. And I think that now becomes even more challenging because the increase in immigration, the increase in secularism, the increase in, in modern technology where everything is more free and accessible, people are less and less entrenched to, I was born in this area, therefore, if a border poll comes, I will vote a certain way because of that. So, look, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and I think that, you know, I have to say that organisations uh, like yourselves here make, make a huge difference. And I think that to, to finalise and sum it up, I think that, you know, unionism has been scared of engagement for too long. And I think that it's a lesson we need to learn and we need to, to get better at it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think, as you said at the end, occasions like this, they're all part and parcel of the way forward. It's crucially important, I think. Now, Emer, it's a great pleasure to introduce Senator Emer Curry. She was appointed uh, a senator in, in June 2020 as a Taoiseach's nominee. She's Fine Gael Shannad spokesperson for special education and inclusion and Northern Ireland serves on the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement Committee and is chair of Sovereign Matters on the British Ireland Parliamentary Assembly. She was elected to Fingal County Council as the first time candidate on the first count in May 2019 for Castlenock local election area. Imar, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to share the platform with you both and to, to meet you, Tom. Um, I suppose when I was thinking about uh, today and um, the theme, and I would agree that certainly a lot of the focus over the last few years has been about the British-Irish relationship. Sitting here right now, how, how do I look at it? Um, since taking up the role as a, a senator in, in 2020 and, and joining at a time when um, we just saw a new decade, new approach, and the document being put together by Julian Smith and Simon Coveney. And I think that was a really good example um, of a relationship and a partnership based on mutual respect um, for the benefit of everyone. And did hark back to the days um, that we so crave for, uh, that we saw with the, uh, the um, framework documents. And I have to pay tribute to John Bruton, who has just recently passed away, his relationship with Major, um, uh, Reynolds' relationship with Major, um, Bertie, of course, with Blair, um, and uh, things in the last four years have been incredibly up and down, but right at this moment in time, to echo a, a, a famous uh, Fianna Fáil slogan, uh, uh, lots done more to do, I would describe it as not great, could be worse. Because we have been through so much over the last four years, and I'm looking at people in this room that have been part of that journey with me. Um, so I'm on the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement Committee. Uh, we did a report um, on the architects of the Good Friday Agreement 25 years on and uh, and that really brought us back to our roots about the three strands and the fact that you you're absolutely you're absolutely right. The eyes were taken off the ball, and um, whenever we achieved the agreement, there wasn't that level of nurturing that needed to to be there, and that's on everybody. And um, but when Bre when Brexit happened. Uh, actually, it has been the East-West relationship that has propped the institutions up and has kept everything going. And so, I, you know, it's, it's easy to be very negative, but I want us to remember that despite Brexit, despite hard Brexit, despite protocol, uh, Windsor agreements, um, despite the legacy bill, the Irish government and the British government are still communicating. Um, so, you know, it, it's a bit like marriage if uh, it can be really going really badly. But as long as you are actually communicating with, with each other, you know, the, the, the show is still on the road. 
Um, and and I think that's very important. Even even this week, we can disagree about the approach to the OMA inquiry, um, and and we would have felt that that should be a joint inquiry. Uh, but at the same time, those conversations are still happening despite an interstate case. Um, so I think that there is we we have moved on from I think very low points um, over the last three or four years. When when Boris was prime minister, we actually we were running out of hope about where a solution was going. It was unilateral action after unilateral action, and um, and I think we are in with the the Varadkar Rishi relationship. I think has been uh, has been better, but of course it it needs to improve. And 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 I think that we are seeing at the moment the impact of that interstate case as well and, and legacy. That is that is that has had an an, a, an effect um on the bilateral relationship. Um, but not only was it not the Good Friday Agreement was it not nurtured the way that it should have, but it wasn't implemented <laughs> the way that it should have been as well. I think that was that was one of our learnings. Um, in in the report that too much of the the agreement wasn't reviewed and tracked and and uh, and, and and that was a very necessary uh, part of it um uh, and and I would like to see now that the that stormont is um functioning again that we do need to get back to basics the first 100 days are going to set the scene and I think it's great that we you know that we can share platforms. Uh, and and talk about the symbolism um, of what has happened and uh, and the good intent, but we do need to see things like north south cooperation properly invested in because we're looking at uh, bodies and uh, and agencies that were set up and areas of cooperation that were set up twenty five years ago and haven't progressed and for all the reason uh, reasons that the lads have have outlined, that's just not that's not good enough um, anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, the shared island funding this week, I think, shows on our part the commitment that we have uh, to wanting genuine partnership in the spirit of cooperation and collaboration. And, you know, there there are aspects of, of the, the UK command paper recently, the safeguarding the union, that I did find disappointing to read after after 25 years where things like the all island economy is seen as a, as competition to the UK internal market when it's actually it's not um you know uh the the our, the north, north side trade is probably about 60% as important as the UK internal market um the the north side trade has has really only increased threefold in the last 25 years so we have seen a big increase in it um, since Brexit, up to 12 billion in, in goods and services. But um, in terms of a, as a competitor to the UK internal market, it isn't. But, you know, there is that expression that a rising tide lifts all boats. And going back to basics, that's what cooperation is supposed to be about. But I will say this, the, 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 the EU market is as important to Northern Ireland as the UK internal market in terms of value. And that is something that we need to grasp, uh, for that Northern Ireland needs to grasp. And as we talk uh, more and more about uh, bringing um, Ireland and the UK closer together, the truth is that we still do have a policy of, the UK still does have a policy of divergence. But, the, but if it continues to diverge, it makes access to the, U, the EU market harder. And to me, that would be an act of economic self-harm. So we do need to encourage um, cooperation on a north-south basis for all the practical reasons that we've spoken about uh, already on the platform. But Northern Ireland does need to get under the skin of the, 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 um, the possibilities and the potential of, of dual market access. Um, and, I, and I suppose if I'm, I'm going to finish on, on anything, it is that... Um, over the last few years, yes, unity has become uh, more uh, on the agenda and, and more people are, are unity curious. But we we as an Irish government haven't stepped into that that um, role of, of planning. Uh, we, we have restated our, our constitutional aspirations. 
And uh, we, I think it is definitely overstating the case to say that a United Ireland is within touching distance. I mean, I just don't, I think that's, a, that's an incorrect um, uh, uh, assumption and actually it doesn't put us on a path to that. Um, and my own view of the future is that if Sinn Féin want a Sinn Féin version of a United Ireland, they're not going to achieve it because they're only they're not going to grow out of of their maybe 33, 34, 35 percent that would support it. The truth is it's going to come down to the reconciliation parties that are going to achieve the change um, that I think we all want to see in terms of uh, bringing identities closer together. But if you want a new or any version of, of a United Ireland, it has to be done by bringing people with you. Um, so I, I think where I was excited to be part of today because of where we are, now that Stormont is, is back up and running, <clears throat> I want to see more progress with Strand 2. The, the British-Irish relationship, as I said, it's not great, but it could be worse. Um, but I am heartened by the, the role of, of um, parliamentarians, by civic groups um, over the last four years, of um, academics that have helped us to make the case um, about uh, fostering good relationships, have kept the wheels going um, and the wheels turning. And, and so I am optimistic for the future, but we do need to see more than just symbolism and sloganeering and populism. We have to back it up with action and it has to benefit us all. In opening, uh, I made one sub important omission. I, I didn't say, and it's very important to say, that this is part, uh, this collaboration today is between the IIA and the John and Pat Hume Foundation. And this series is called Build, uh, Building Common Ground, was established by the John and Pat Hume Foundation with the aim of creating genuine and inclusive opportunities for dialogue and discussion, which will enhance relationships in Northern Ireland, on the island of Ireland, and between Ireland and Britain. So the three standard, the famous three standard relationships. So, I mean, Alex Atwood, the administrator of the, of the foundation is here. Hugh Logue, who's on the board, is here. So it's particularly salient that we're having this conversation at all. Um, but we're having it in a, in, a new, in a new context. And maybe before we get into the questions, maybe I just ask each of you, what are your... I mean, we seem to have started uh, with the executive and the assembly and the relationship, apparently good relationship, between the first and deputy first minister we seem to be starting on a good foot footing through this. So over the next year, what each of you would you hope will happen or be possibly aimed for or achieved over the next year? Because we are, you know, if both countries are having elections within the next year, there or thereabouts, that will be the moment for real thinking about a longer term future. But we have a shorter term future to, to, to deal with first. Charlotte, what would your hopes be? The hope over the next year, Tom, and I'm going to be elastic with your timeline, yeah. but the hope over the next year is for stability. And I really do take David's point, and I'll come back to that, about the difference between stable government and functioning government. The hope must be stability. Mm -hmm. In the midst of the chaos that we're living through, and the challenges that we're facing and the potential turmoil that elections can throw up both here in the United States, across Europe, stability in Northern Ireland, in the context of agreement now about the uh, approach to Europe and the protocol withdrawal agreement and uh, Windsor framework and so on. Stability is the key. And if we can have a year of stability, we haven't had that for a very long time. Mm. So the key within all of that, I think, is colleagues have touched on it. We don't talk enough anymore about reconciliation. Today's title is Reconciling Relations. If you look at it, the core constitutional positions within the Good Friday Agreement and within Article 3 of the Constitution of Ireland are by and large quite similar. 
the Article 3 talks about the firm will of the people uh, of Ireland to, to unite the people of Ireland in friendship and harmony and subject to the principle of consent to then unite the island. The agreement is premised on reconciliation, rapprochement, respect, and rights. Those are broadly similar in the Venn diagram. That's the space that we need to be in over the next period of time. In the six sittings of the assembly before the assembly was restored, the word reconciliation was used twice. Those were being used to try and elect a speaker that was never elected. The word reconciliation was used twice. Reconciliation is not currently a word that we even use, never mind properly explore. And I think that when you look at the dictionary definition, which is something, um, you know, somebody like Hugo McNeil will say, what's the dictionary definition? The dictionary de definition is about coexistence. And that goes back to the question, the open question that I asked initially. In terms of where reconciliation was at uh, uh, in uh, social coexistence 15 years ago, there was a program for government agreed in 2007, 2008. And part of the reason that the agreement was reached between Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley was because language that Ian Paisley had used and the DUP had used around social reform, social transformation, social inclusion, and in broad terms, equality of opportunity, was brought by Martin McGuinness to the table. And they were then able to agree the language that they had already used. There are ways that we can make programs for government function in a collective. So that's the short term. In the longer term, I think we're looking at uh, the governments coming to the table around a new treaty-based or broad agreement-based approach to the next generation of evolution. Now, reconciliation, rapprochement, and respect and rights have to be at the very heart of that. But so too does a higher worldview, which looks beyond just the internal, at times, egocentric view that we have of ourselves in the North, that looks broader to the kind of challenges that I talked about earlier. I'll leave it there for now. Dave said in your opening commentary that on, on balance, uh, the restoration of the institutions, a good thing. And obviously it was a, a maybe a close run thing within the DUP and uh, Jeffrey Donaldson, I think, achieved a great deal in, in politically and otherwise to get it get it over the line. So that's if it's a good thing and you obviously want it to work, how would that manifest itself over the next year or so? I think that's the big challenge because it goes back to the, the line I used earlier about stable government and, 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 and functioning, functional government. And I think that part of the challenge we have here is that there are a number of, of problems that need to be solved. And I mean, if I was cynical, I don't think it's necessarily in the interest of Sinn Féin to solve them because I think it is a very easy, I mean, if I, if I was in Sinn Féin, it is a very easy um, slogan to say this is a failed statelet because this place doesn't work. Now, that is probably slightly uh, crass of me, but from a, a unionist point of view, the only way to sell the union, as we talk about, is to make Northern Ireland function almost on a, on a, in an independent way. And I'm not advocating for an independent uh, Northern Ireland or Ulster, if anyone thinks I am, but... Our, can, our problem is, and I think Gordon Brown uh, said it in one of his memoirs where he said, you know, there was never a treasury, uh, there's never a chancellor that uh, went to Northern Ireland and come home with any money in his pockets. And I think that <laughs> the, the challenge that we have here is twofold. So if you look at it from the union's point of view, we can't just go sort of go to daddy for our, our pocket money because we need to stand on our own two feet. And I think as well from a, from a, a, a separatist point of view, whether it is Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland or the SNP in Scotland, um, and I say this having obviously worked in Scotland, I don't know what the SNP would do when they have an independent Scotland because they'll not have a British government to blame. So I think that we need to have grown up politics and we need to make difficult decisions. So, you know, you asked well, what do I want to see in the first year. I want to see an appetite to actually reform potentially the institutions, or that's probably a conversation for another day, mm. but certainly the health service, the education system are the two for me where we need to be looking and saying, look, 
there's too much there. There's not enough there. How do we solve this problem on our own? And I think I would probably even go further again to say, when it comes to the wider landscape of Northern Ireland, our public sector, in my view, is too big uh, per, per head of capita. And I think that we need to look at a way that we are driving inward investment and growing our economy to ensure 10, 20, 30 years, whenever the border pro comes, that in my view as a unionist, we're in as strong a position as possible to sell ourselves as part of the UK. Okay. Emer, your perspective? Um, so I, again, listening to uh, the lads and, and their views and agree that, uh, yes, we need stability. Yes, we need renewal. But I do think, um, yes, we need reconciliation. But I think in order to do those things, we do need reform. Um, I think uh, the St. Andrew's Agreement um, put us into a place where it enables and emboldens the two main parties not to engage in reconciliation, um, to coexist in silos. And, uh, and I'm uncomfortable with that. I prefer the, where it was previously. Um, and, and I think it has damaged uh, prospects of reconciliation. So I, I, under the new decade, new approach, um, there is a mechanism for forums, for um, civil, for civic engagement on issues. I would love to see um, something like that uh, to discuss reform, to hear from people, um, an equivalent of a citizens assembly in the North about how they would like to, to reform um, uh, the, the Strand One. That's, uh, I, I'm I'm always surprised and alarmed that some people think that that is a bold move when actually it's part of the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement was never meant to just um, exist as it is now as a monument or a relic that we can't uh, evolve. Um, and I think for the sake of, of uh, North-South cooperation and trust in North-South co cooperation, because it is depressing that after you know, 25 years um, of the Good Friday Agreement, 50 years from um, Sunning Deal, that uh, there is such suspicion around um, uh, uh, North-South cooperation and, 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 and so many opportunities that are being lost. So, you know, we have seen the benefits of, say, um, uh, paediatric um, cross-border health. Um, we have an all-island cancer strategy um, we have seen uh, tourism flourish, although that too is, is under threat because of divergence with the um, electronic travel authorization that's being introduced in, in the UK. Um, we, have to, we have to reimagine the potential um, and, uh, and identify those areas, not just, that's my hair again, or it might be my earring. <laughs> They're speaking. They're not agreeing with me. Um, but we have to reimagine those areas of cooperation because the other the other part of it is, um, I think people themselves will get frustrated at um at those lost opportunities, and I am all for close relationships east west and uh, and areas where we can um see efficiencies. Why why wouldn't we? But we are in a difficult position because. The UK has chosen a path of divergence, and mm -hmm. um, and and that has that has been a policy. It, that is a policy in itself, and and it is beholden on 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 the the Irish government to work harder. But we all need to work harder. And one thing that I I, I omitted to say was I agree with what you say about humility. Now is the time for for humility on all on all sides. Um, uh, and and I, I think that's probably a good word to bring us into the path of reconciliation as well, because the last five years have knocked chunks. We have knocked chunks out of each other um, yeah. and not deliberately. But that is the path that we were on. Yeah. And, and now now we need to 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 just move on. Yeah. I'd like to give voices from the audience because, you know, we've uh, uh, people in the audience have good views and clear views. And I want to take four or five. So Francis and, and the four that in that, in that row. So uh, Francis, would you like to, and maybe just everybody just say who they are. First. Yeah, Francis Jacobs, member of the Institute. And thank you very much all three of you for really nice, interesting presentations. My question is perhaps more oriented to David. And that is a little bit about the mindset within the unionist community. 
when you see opinion polls, the majority seem to be still against the protocol in the Windsor framework, um, were unhappy with the restoration of the executive in the assembly. Um, but how do they think that that's going to lead to a sustainable uh, Northern Ireland? It seems to go in the opposite direction from that. Linked to that is what do they feel about the apparent, I think more than apparent, lack of sympathy and interest in Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK? I mean, you've obviously worked a lot in Glasgow and Scotland. That was the area with the area where there's the greater sympathy. And yet even that seems to have, the Scottish understanding of Northern Ireland seems to have weakened. And finally, they're all related. The final one is, why, is the, why have unionist politicians, especially in the DUP, seem to put so little emphasis on trying to win friends elsewhere? I worked in the European Parliament. DUP never joined a political group in the US. Very little to counteract the incredibly effective Sinn Féin uh, lobbying. And I just wonder why, why that's the case. We will hold the, the question very for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you to the panel. It's been fascinating. And I wanted to remember um, Pat Hume today, um, 86th birthday, I saw. So, um, um, but um, I have so many questions, and I'll just try and keep it down. Um, so, one question is. Um, Colleagues, I worked with in a project in UCL, Connor Kelly and Alan Rennick, in a podcast for Aaron's, said that they thought there was a danger of demonizing loyalists and unionists who aren't, in a sense, on message with the kind of alliance type unionist voice and treating them as dinosaurs. And I wondered, do you think, looking back over the past how many years? Six, seven, six years, maybe, say, maybe from Johnson period, particularly, but were we all? In a way down here, did we tend to do that, some of us, and that we underestimated the strength of identity, just as nationalists of identity, that this was an identity issue. So that's my core question. I have niggly little questions about the shared island and also the legacy case we're taking, because I understand all the reasons I'm a real shared island person, as many of you will know. But I wonder, for shared island, it seems outside the agreement. It does seem like Le Mass O'Neill no matter how much we refer to the agreement's ethos, it's not part of strand two, and that slightly worries me a little. The legacy case is so delicate, I, I won't really go there, I suppose, with it, but just from, from a diplomatic perspective, it's obviously a response to a very undiplomatic British government over the past few years, but it is damaging. Okay. Could we, you oh, and okay, then- Canham Trinity College, Dublin. Yeah, okay, thanks very much, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Frank O'Donnell. <clears throat> um, I spend a good bit of time in this country, but I'm resident in Vienna, and um, I've worked for the UN for a long time. And in the past 10 years of my retirement, I've spent a lot of my time moderating panel discussions between former presidents and prime ministers of different countries around the world, and also participating in Bertie Ahern's work in the Interaction Council. I think that everything that you've said, the three of you, has been wonderful, and I want to congratulate you and Tom for this fabulous, uh, fabulous panel. And I'm particularly interested in what Charlotte was saying about the more global challenges we have. Now, from my point of view, this little Irish, Anglo-Irish cocoon <laughs> is extremely important because you have to succeed. You absolutely cannot afford to fail. Much of the rest of the world is looking at the Irish experience. And it is so promising, especially the way the new executive has got off uh, the two ladies working apparently closely together. But I think that the issue of rhetoric or narrative or language, if you wish, is extremely important. And one has to change the rhetoric, the dialogue, and it was a very important uh, address given on, on the Judenplatz in Vienna by uh, the American historian Timothy Snyder a few years ago, where basically it was on Europe Day. He said, you are more than your myths. So for all your identity issues, what really should matter most is perhaps the quality of connectivity 
rather than the preservation of identity. So I want to leave that idea with you. Uh, and, and I'll stop there because I could go on for too long as I normally do. Frank, thank you very much. Lovely to see you again. I couldn't remember where I met you last. But Andy, you had your hand up. Andy Pollock, please. Is to take up something that Joel has said, a couple of points that Joel has said. Um, what chance do you think there is for progress and stability in Northern Ireland based on a kind of double compromise, which was identified by Jala, that um, the nationalists would accept that for the, for the foreseeable future, there will be two states on this island, and unionists would accept that a, a central part of the post Good Friday Agreement period is that there would be greater cooperation in areas like the economy, climate change, health, and tourism, that kind of double compromise. The nationalist compromise on the two states and the union's compromise on all island cooperation. What, what do the speakers think are the realistic chances of that being the way forward? There's plenty in, in all of those questions for all of you, but David, I think the first couple of them were more towards you. So could we start with you? I, I think um, that I'll start with your last question because I think it's a very good one about... Uh, I said it when I when I opened about the total lack of engagement that unionists have have taken part in. That was a great frustration of mine. In fact, I think probably Arlene Foster uh, at at her height saw that as a as a clear uh, need within the unionist community. Um, again, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but you know I remember the idea and hearing where. You know, Danny Morrison had got leaflets regarding during the hunger strikes on on the tables of senators in America, um, and I, I don't want to open that that can of worms tonight. But that just highlighted how far ahead I think Sinn Fein were in their propaganda in comparison to unionists. And and again, just bear with me a short anecdote. And again, the the, the facts shall not be all in the right order. But um, you know, if you recall when uh, President Clinton got Jerry Adams an emergency visa, I think it was just pre pre ceasefire in 94 if I'm not mistaken uh and there was a peace conference in America and um unionists went to the peace conference as well but they stood outside with placards and uh because of the immorality of allowing Jerry Adams and and, and et cetera et cetera to be there but when the world's media uh, and we all know we make a, a choice regarding a political leader as you know you're making the dinner and the kids are going mad in the background. You see some on the TV and and something clicks to say good, bad or ugly. And if the world's media takes a casting glance at that event, who's the bad guy? You know, is it the guy who, despite all his denials, you know, according to Ed Maloney, was the most influential man ever in the present IRA, or is it the guys outside with the placards who, you know, maybe have never heard a fly? And I know the answer, and that, that to me sums up where where unionism now is. I think in regarding the mindset, and, and it's a difficult one, I was brought up west, west of the ban. And, you know, to be honest, I mean, by my own admission, I went to school, which was exclusively Protestant. I went to the BB, I went to church, uh, played football, the team that was exclusively Protestant. I probably actually never spoke to many Catholics, in all honesty, until I kind of got my first job. And, and it wasn't because I was brought up in a Christian household. It wasn't a bigoted household. It was just society or the part of society I lived in and I think probably that 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 sense of uh living uh in that kind of narrow mindset is still there for for some unionists and it's not a criticism but it's because and I think you mentioned it's, it's about how important our identity is to us and I think what has happened particularly since the Belfast agreement uh, the whether you want to say the unionist loyalist community has not made the most and benefited from European money, peace funding, whatever you want to call it. Because if I drive down areas in inner city Belfast are stereotypically Protestant, they're in a very different state aesthetically than if I go down the Falls Road where there are restaurants which are in the top five and TripAdvisor, there are community groups. And so, so we, in my view, as unionists, will rightly say we haven't benefited from the Belfast Agreement the way nationalists have. No, I think a lot of that is a problem of our own making. But I think that leads to the point about a minority of unionists and loyalists feeling demonised. I mean, in, in the UK, unless you are, are 
part of the Roma traveling community, the only other group the, the only other group that can do uh, uh, worse than you is um, white working class Protestant boys. So your chance of getting five A stars to see at GCSE. So that what that creates is 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 an underclass of people, and I suspect that 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 is where, and you consider when Simon Coveney was there and and there was the security alert, that actually highlighted where someone like Simon Coveney would have been seen symbolically as a threat to the identity of, of certain loyalists. Because you've got to bear in mind, you know, without giving a history lesson, unions talk about their DNA going back to, you know, the siege of Derry and shouting no surrender, going through to uh, the Somme when, you know, the 36th Ulster Division lost more men than anyone else that day. And I remember there being a sense reading up as I was growing older where there was a sense of the unionism when he said to the British government, you owe us. And I think it goes to, to your point where there's been a sense of betrayal amongst the unionist community, potentially going back as far as Lord Carson, where, you know, essentially home rule, the Home Rule Bill, which was brought through by the British government and, and ironically was de defeated by a man from Dublin. So, you know, that, that I think is ingrained within our DNA. And I think in particular, because of the education under achievement, and because now, particularly with deindustrialization, because now of the level of deprivation, which has become generational in certain parts of loyalist Northern Ireland, um, that there is a job of work to be done by the British government, by the Irish government, and 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 by everyone to recognise that the people who have still opposed the protocol have clear, legitimate political positions, and I think it is too easy, as you say, to demonise them as. They want to go back to the good old days of when the Ulster Workers Council could bring Northern Ireland to a, a standstill. That's too easy. The reality of it is, you know, the Nigel Dodds is the Sammy Wilsons who are opposing this deal. They're not opposing it because, you know, Nigel Dodds was shot by the IRA when he's in visiting his disabled son his deathbed. It's not because he wants to go back to the dark days. It's because he clearly believes, you know, an, an award-winning barrister from Cambridge University clearly believes that uh, there there are concerns for the unionist people. So I think overall you're right to say that's actually probably something I didn't mention earlier was that that piece around educational underachievement, mm -hmm. which I think is critical to the future stability of society. Yeah, it, it very obviously is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I go to Emer next, if with your permission. Um so the the double compromise and um, the suggestion that we would officially say there's going to be no change. Is that what that's the kind of thing that you're talking about, Andy? Well, you're not even saying officially. Basically, a, a little bit of compromise on both sides around the all having coverage on one side, accepting some states that are stable people on the other side. It's not written down, but it's informing policy. Yeah, you see, we have so many agreements al already, and that's it's it's already uh it's it's already in an agreement that we we are supposed to be. Uh, cooperating north south um, and in relation to a border a border poll um we some Sinn Féin might say that a border they've been saying really since since 2020 that we should have a border poll now united ireland is around the corner we know that that isn't true and um, we but we do know by looking at the figures that we are um heading at some it looks like we're heading uh, to that point at at some stage um, because of the the demographics of people who do want a united Ireland following. So I think we are on an interesting path, but I don't think anything about this island is inevitable. Um, and I think you have to put the work into it rather than just saying um, that it's, it, it is going to happen. So I would be afraid, Andy, that if, if, if we took a position and said there's, there, the status quo is, is, is as it is, as it said in, in, in the UK command paper, that we're not accepting our, that there is a constitutional aspiration that's legitimate. And perhaps we have downplayed that constitutional aspiration o o over the, the last since the Good Friday Agreement, but that we do need to think about the future. And, and, and actually, we do need to think about prioritizing reconciliation politics. And, uh, and the, my aspiration that we do 
um, uh, reach a day where there is a united Ireland that's based on an agreed Ireland um, and 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 one um, uh, where uh, where reconciliation has been uh, progressed and achieved. But I am I am constantly struck about the obsession with Sinn Féin when you're you're talking about you know when Sinn Féin. Um, uh, Sinn Féin and what they're doing in the US and we know that Sinn Féin are in Europe with a, a, an aggressive strategy um, at the moment talking about a united Ireland as well and I think actually we need to stop thinking about Sinn Féin's version of the future and we need for, for unionists not to define themselves by what they're not but who they are and we as reconcil reconciliation politicians um, need to be very clear about what we stand for and let Sinn Féin do what they're going to do because I don't believe that triumphalist politics is going to win. Um, and and I'll, I'll just pick up on, on a, a couple of things. You're absolutely right about connectivity, but we overstate how, uh, again, how close we are to a, a united Ireland whenever only 0.6% of students from the north come south for university. How can we think, and, and, and as somebody that has lived in Tyrone and has lived in Dublin, and I'm, I'm looking at a, a, another fellow northerner who's lived north and south, it depresses me how actually the interest in the north is superficial and that people don't really know each other and, and aren't as close as they should be. And there is a massive disconnect. So we have so many paths to walk before we actually talking about um, the future that seems that some people think is, is, is around the corner. And there's so much that can be done without lobbing it in with constitutional and, 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 and identity issues. Um, and, and in relation to the um, educational unattainment and uh, Etienne's uh, question about um, loyalism, I think the frustration was directed at politicians who, sh who should have known better about the, the, um, the impact of a hard Brexit but I don't think anyone ever um, has been uh, annoyed or upset with loyalism or the unionist people. Um, and actually, I agree completely about the importance of the, the Good Friday Agreement dividend. And, and part of the Sherrod Island funding is actually, I think, thir about 34 million that, where we have said it should go towards um, education, uh, loyalist uh, men in, in particular and programs. So again, we know what the issues are. We've just got to get on with doing them. David, do you want to come back in? Just step in and, and say that I think as Hamer says, I think a lot of a lot of what you've mentioned is happening at the moment, I suppose, on, on unofficially. And I think that I was on the, the view a few weeks ago on the BBC and you know, I said that the, the future of the union won't be won by people like me who walk with an orange colour out in the twelfth. It'll be won by people who are in Donegal in the 12th or people who are in Spain. Equally, I don't think a united Ireland will be achieved by people who are in Milltown Cemetery on Easter Sunday morning because the same people will be in Donegal or Spain. It's that middle ground. A lot of people who will be at the Aviva for, for Ireland's game on Saturday. And I think, and, and I know that Tim and I had spoken in this offline, where if you consider the constituency I live in in South Belfast, you know, there Hannah Garner is a really strong vote because she's a gregarious individual, she's a hard worker and obviously an excellent representative. Um, but I have no doubt that there will be people who vote for Clare who would vote to remain part of the United Kingdom. And I think that that you're right, Emer, in highlighting where Sinn Féin's idea of a united Ireland uh, is not an example that anybody in this island should be uh, should be achieving any more than certain people's ideas of Northern Ireland and some people who probably believe for Olympia in 2024 that well, we're still in 1924, where obviously, you know, the idea of an orange parliament for an orange people. And I think that, you know, we both have to look at the extremes on both sides to say, I don't think anyone wants that. And I think it's about making, as I say, the middle ground. And as I say, the People here in Donegal on Easter Sunday morning and on the 12th of July are people who 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 will maintain the balance of this island. 
Thank you. Before going over to you, uh, Jonathan, that you've, you've a big canvas to 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 speak about. I just want to pick up something that's come in online and is from Mike Nebs Mike Nesbitt, uh, who is a member of the board of the John and Pat Hume Foundation, and it connects a bit with I think Andy's comment. Uh, and his question is, if Jarlath is correct about constitutional evolution, and I think he is, would the panel agree the least likely next outcomes are the status quo and the traditional single 32 county sovereign state? That's from Mike. But anyway. That's well, so uh, I suppose bring in Andy's point and Mike's point together. And, and also the issue of narrative because narrative framing is critical to how we understand and explore the road ahead. The idea of kind of conceptualizing as two states, one system is really a simple way, Andy, for people to philosophically <clears throat> grasp the state of play, um, a way that people can understand the realities of the foreseeable future, that we are not going to see constitutional revolution on this island. There will be constitutional evolution across both islands. We do need much greater one system thinking. That's an absolute. And I've seen it when I was in the health service. I've seen it in other government departments that I've been attached to or worked with. And I think that coming to Mike's point then, the next stage on this island will still involve a Northern Ireland in my view, and a Northern Ireland Assembly, in my view, will be in place for some time to come. And it actually needs to be. So one of the things that uh, the UK government did well, and they deserve credit for this, is they built into the protocol Article 2. And Article 2 is about the non-diminution of the equality and rights provisions of the Good Friday Agreement. That maintains, that wasn't disputed by colleagues from a pro-union background. It wasn't disputed by colleagues here in Dublin from the Irish government. It wasn't changed at all. So there are provisions within the agreement protected within the Windsor framework, which have to apply within the infrastructure of Northern Ireland as it currently exists, and that's with the Assembly. And I think in practical terms, there needs to be a reality check. We need, first of all, real politic to start informing how we interact with each other and how we go on that open exploration of the question around sustainable coexistence that I asked at the start. But the reality check about what it means to suddenly join public policy and public services across this island. Um, and I'll give you an example. So I'm in the, uh, spent seven years as a, a senior manager in the health service. The, Emergency control rooms of the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, Police Service of Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Fire Service are all separate. They all operate on different software. Question today would be, it makes good sense that you would put together a program board to establish a single emergency call centre for Northern Ireland. with all the protocols that would need to be there with police information and so on, whereby emergencies could be responded to on uh, a coordinated basis. That would make good theoretical sense. It would also cost a huge amount of money, tens of millions to do that kind of thing. It would also require a long-term strategic plan. Now, does that happen today? Does that discussion even happen today in Northern Ireland? Or do we wait until there is some bigger constitutional change around Irish unity, and then say, well, we can deal with it then. So we're in a conundrum of having to deal with public policy dilemmas, transformations, requirements today in both jurisdictions on the island, which have grown up, like it or not, differently. How do we then join those in a way that unites people, the firm will of the people, and friendship and harmony to come together? We do that, I think, through one system thinking. And that means, MOUs, it means greater cooperation, it means the two governments leading the exemplary, symbolic and structural approach to leadership, more and more talking together, more and more appearing together, 
Yes, it will take some time for London to stabilise again. Yes, it is diverging, but I don't think that will go on forever. I think that the challenges that are coming in require all of us to have a, a different kind of approach, and that is starting to um, be understood in London. So that's where I see it, Andy. I think the language is about narrative. It's about shaping and framing the real politic that we're going to see in the time ahead. And I think that the, the bigger issue then just around people feeling included in society. Fair employment has worked in Northern Ireland. The campaign for the end of job discrimination and new fair employment legislation has worked. I sat on the Equality Commission for seven years. In recent years, complaints of political or religious discrimination in employment are well below 10%. That's a fundamental transformation in where Northern Ireland was at 30 and 40 years ago when people like Emer's father or my father were campaigning for civil rights. The same thing then can be applied in other aspects of social policy in terms of education, social inclusion, in terms also of uh, a much more focused approach to public policy delivery. The riots that happened, supposedly as a result of Brexit, a number of years ago on the interface of the Springfield Road and the Shankill Road, happened precisely in the area where there was supposed to be a new university campus built, which was promised the first sods dug uh, by Bill Clinton and Tony Blair in 1997 or 98. And Tim would remember that. And the university never happened. So if we're going to promise things to people, we have to deliver them to them as well. I make a big exception. I was going to close, but you got your hand up just in time. So the, you, you literally have the last one of the last words. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> uh, that's lovely. Mary Freehill is my name. I'm, I suppose, almost an emeritus Labour count, uh, city, Dublin City Councillor at this stage, and Committee of the Regions, uh, and I'm a, a Cavan from Manor border girl and a Dublin woman. Uh, so all of this has, has deep resonance uh, for me. Um, and in fact, David, when you were talking about one's antecedents and so forth, I found it very interesting uh, doing uh, my family history and certainly finding a lot of intermarriages uh, in the 1800s mm. uh, in my family that would be considered Catholic. And I think that's something we don't often uh, think of. You know, there was a time when there was certainly much more um, uh, people who kind of see it as otherwise. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for today. And the thoughts that I just want to share with you is that um, I just, I'm very much agree uh, with having um, greater integration and greater connection between North and South. And I just think that the focus has been kind of more institutional. And there's not all that great an opportunity for people in the North and people in the South to come together and to get to know one another. And I found that uh, I recently joined the A.E. Russell Society, that Russell uh, grew up in Larkin, lived in Dublin most of his life. And uh, uh, there, you know, we now have, we instituted a new organisation of the Arts Club recently, uh, where there are a lot of people now in the South who are also members. Um, but to try and actually get some help in actually having people travel north side South, apart from the two dozen who, you know, are, are committed. Uh, it's not that easy. Uh, you know, we talk about the peace funds, but you need very sophisticated administrative structures to be able to work through that. Um, and a lot of the others. And um, Emer, maybe I could put it to you. I'm just wondering if, um, uh, if there might be, you know, thinking about maybe the idea of making it a little bit easier through maybe the peace funds by having administrative uh, support systems, you know, for particular groups and particularly in the arts. And we have seen um, uh, certainly in, in uh, the 
there were about nine months ago, a wonderful um, uh, concert in the concert hall uh, from uh, North Donegal and, and Derry. And I mean, the, the, that was, in fact, that was the fruits of investment way back 30 years ago in Derry, Donegal, in, in the peninsula there. Uh, so, you know, I think it's finding what we have in common and it doesn't have to be politics. It's the cultural um, 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 discovery that we can make uh, on the north and the south of this island. And I just think it would be wonderful if we could actually get a little bit more help uh, in whether it's historical groups, genealogical groups, uh, political, you know, in the broad sense, uh, groups that I think it could be, you know, we can actually get down to the ground and I think that would be very useful. And if you want to suggest anyone that I could talk to about that, that, you know, where we could maybe try and do something about that would be very useful. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks, Mary. And I mean, in a way, that's a very fitting closure um, to our discussion. I, I want to thank the three of you because... I think it's been a really rich and fruitful uh, discussion. And I think it's one of, it's, this is exactly the sort of thing that's going to happen, has to happen much more frequently in many more circumstances. Um, I, I think there's no doubt about it that the, the new arrangement, the, the risk restoration of the, of the institutions in Northern Ireland and the way it appears that they are going, the optimistic uh, way they've started, um, it's perhaps there's a sense of a new beginning. And the question is, can that really, can the promise that that seems to represent be realized? Uh, I could give you a, a, a little forewarning of something else that's happening, which is going to add to the, conver to the conversation. Uh, one of Ireland's most eminent filmmakers, who I think is watching online, Alan Gilson, is launching on Sunday at the Dublin Film Festival at two o'clock in the lighthouse, a, a, a program, a, a new documentary called The Irish Question. And included in that is conversations and interviews with a very wide range of key people who have participated in the Irish question from Bill Clinton, John Major, uh, and a whole range of people. And Alan was t t telling me about it the other day. And I think given his reputation and his, his, his production of only excellent work, I think that's another, that, that will be one of the next contributions to this debate. But this contribution this evening has been important. And I think thanks to the IAA and the Human Foundation uh, for sponsoring it. And let us continue. <laughs>